Blog Talk Radio. Stevie B's Media Production is a part of the Shellcaster Network. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by members of the Churches of Christ. With your host, Stevie R. Butler. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Good evening, wherever you're on the world listening to this radio broadcast. Stevie B's Media Production presents the Gospel Light Radio Show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler. And this radio show is being broadcast from Stevie B Media Production at the Carolina Studio in the great state of North Carolina with my co-host, Glenn McMillian from the state of Texas, Dr. Frank Washington from the state of Florida, Stanley Hubbard from the state of Indiana, Clay Phillips from the state of Georgia, Steve Cordo from the state of Illinois, Robert Lee Johnson from the state of Florida, and Yusuf Ford from the state of Indiana, and Brian Christian Coleman from the state of New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just grateful for the privilege to bring you a program where we as Christians and members of the Churches of Christ can share our faith and preach and teach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ on a weekly basis. If you'd like to contact us while we're on the air this evening, just give us a call to the live show at 713-955-0508 or you can go to the Blog Talk Radio website and listen to the show live there. You'll find this show on page one of that website. There's over 1,700 live shows on that website, and you'll consistently find this radio show on pages one through four of that website. What a blessing. Now, if you have any questions or comments for any of my co-hosts, you can uh, send your emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com, or you can call Stevie B's Media Production at the Carolina Studio at 910-491-6405. Now, again, this program is brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ, and if you need any assistance in locating the congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks, get out your Bibles and stay along with us here on the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Before we go into our program for this evening, I would ask that you would buy with me a word of prayer that we may thank God for this opportunity. Our most kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, the Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our hearts that we are on this broadcast and we're prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, pleasure to be with my co-hosts on the show this evening, Yusuf Ford and Steve Cordo, as they break into our listeners, the bread of light. And also my co-host, Clay Phillips, as he answers the questions that are on the hearts of so many. We just pray that you'll bless them and their families that support their efforts, that they may continue to sow the seed of the kingdom. Father, we pray that you will bless our listeners who are tuning in via Blog Talk Radio as well as through social media. We pray that they may listen well, they may consider their eternal stance before you, and that their hearts may be pricked. And it will cause them to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you so much for sending the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who died such a cruel death on Calvary's cross. We recognize that without such a sacrifice, we would not have a hope, eternal life. Father, even now we ask you to forgive us for the transgressions of our own heart. We know our flesh is weak, and we often fall short of thy will. For I pray that you'll continue to bless us and keep us and love us all the days of our lives. And that we have been faithful until death. Father, we pray that you will save us. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it all. Amen. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. 
In the first segment of the broadcast, my co-host, Yusuf Ford, he serves as the evangelist for the Livingstone Church of Christ there in Indianapolis, Indiana. He'll be making this proclamation of the gospel of Christ. And in the second segment, we have a question from my social media platform on Facebook called Shout It Out. It will be posing to my co-host, Clay Phillips. He serves as the evangelist for the Rose City Church of Christ there in Thomasville, Georgia. He'll be answering our question in that segment. And to close out the show, my co-host, Steve Cordo, he serves as the evangelist for the East Park Church of Christ there in Danville, Illinois, and he'll be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ to close out the show. So open up your Bibles now and open your minds, and let's have a great show. After the break, the next voice should be that of my co-host, Yusuf Ford. Enjoy the show. You're listening to the Gospel Length Radio Show. listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Good evening, Stevie B, and good evening to all of you that have joined this program. We are very thankful you decided to share your time with us tonight. We hope, as always, that you will continue to thrive and be in excellent health and spirit. And tonight I will pray the prayer of Moses upon the children of Israel, that same prayer upon you. He said, The Lord bless thee 
and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And that is my prayer for all of you tonight. Our topic for discussion is entitled, Move On or Stand Still. No one wants to start over in any lifelong project. It's certainly sometimes uh, a situation that faces many of us, but often we must. And I remember, (laughs) for an example, a church building uh, in the city of Indianapolis that was blown down several times because of storms in the area and if you know anything about the northeast side of indianapolis we got some some terrible storms that come through there and so this building this church building that was going up was blown down i I can remember at least six or seven times and that would create a dilemma for most ministers however this particular minister was determined to proceed and his persistence paid off and i'm happy to announce that At least the last time I drove by that side of town, the building was still standing. He had his reasons for not giving up and standing still. And tonight I'll give you several reasons why we should. I also recently read a tragic story of two people that were flying in an aircraft with two pilots that gave them great concern during the trip back home to their destination. So I'm studying to be a, a pilot myself. And the flight was so unstable and concerning that the passengers decided to disembark, get off the plane at the next leg. And it was a good decision to do so because the two pilots never made it to their next destination. Unfortunately, they crashed the jet and both of their lives were lost due to inadequate experience in landing at this particular airport and this particular flying this particular aircraft and that's that's very sad the the passenger's decision to move on and drive home the rest of the way no doubt saved their lives so sometimes standing or starting from scratch is not always easy but prudent and there will be many difficult days ahead we have to deal with fatigue and stress and things like that. We'll, we'll ask ourselves, and some may be asking tonight, why am I even doing this? Why do I keep doing this? So it's not easy. Uh, difficult days lies ahead. Uh, philosophers tell us that there's a fine line between insanity and genius. And those of us who choose to forge on dare sometimes to straddle the line. So moving forward, when the masses choose to to go back, has to deal with a single word in my mind at least, or maybe just uh, an important character to have, and that deals with diligence. Diligence helps build discipline, confidence, and resilience. The Bible speaks of this at length, about diligence. And I want to share a few scriptures, as I always do, with you and I want to begin with the wise man Solomon you know who he is wise man the wise man Solomon to begin he wrote in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 4 he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand but the hand of the diligent maketh rich and the easy read version says lazy hands will make you poor hard working hands will make you rich and it's certainly easy to understand that that passage for most of us It's so important to be diligent in our work. As I'm thinking about this passage, though, at the time that Solomon was writing this, you have to remember, put yourself in that time period, because a lot of those expressions in Proverbs dealt with manual labor and working in fields. There was a lot of, there were a lot of farmers and herders, you know, sheep herders and uh, people that, um, uh, iron smiths and people that worked with their hands. It was very difficult work. But a lot of those expressions, even in the New Testament that Jesus dealt with, were dealing with people who worked with their hands, most mostly farmers. And that's why he used a lot of those different types of parables. Re- people could relate to that. And so looking at it in that regard, you can understand, and you will understand as I'm reading 
several more of these passages from the Old Testament, how it relates to the importance of being diligent. Verse 5 of that same chapter, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 5 says, A son who works hard, this is easy to read too, A son who works hard while it is harvest time will be successful, but one who sleeps through the harvest is worthless. <laughs> that's that's the Old Testament uh, and easy to read version of it. I understand that too. Listen, think about a farmer. If you think about farming and farmers, they work very hard. They work very hard. They're usually up early in the morning before sunrise, 2 and 3 in the morning, getting prepared. And then they're, you know, working all day and, and follow, you know, and that ends it late in the evening. And so a lot of times they don't get a lot of sleep and rest during seeding time and harvest time. And that's what this this scripture is referring to so you know if i had sons and i was a farmer that you know were lazy and didn't want to keep up with the workload and just kind of taking it easy while everyone would was laboring as hard as they could to make our family you know to to a living i as a father i'd be very disappointed as well that's where solomon's coming from here Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24, it says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Now, here's the easy read version. Those who work hard will be put in charge of others, but lazy people will have to work like slaves. You see that every single day. Some of you have experienced that, you know, uh, how people are moving up the ladder, the very focus diligent, hardworking individuals on the job are often promoted. But those individuals who who are usually slackers and hiding from their bosses and, you know, just ducking out and you can't find them when their project's going on and supposed to be doing their job, usually are stuck in those types of jobs um, the rest of their lives, or at least in the, in the careers that we've seen. So we can understand that particular proverb. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4, the, slow, the soul that... The soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. And that, you know, looking at that from both a physical and spiritual point of view, really makes a lot of sense. Because if you've been in the church long enough, you've seen people come in that sort of just show up on at services every now and again. Or they don't study, you know, you you want to hear a word from the Lord as like this program you want to hear the preacher but you don't want to they don't really want to do any studying and digging for themselves they're always seems to be falling behind in things and they're always making a lot of little mistakes and errors and they're at the altar a lot to be honest or they're calling on the preacher I, I remember very early on in my ministry I would get calls early in the morning two and three in the morning and all throughout the day from people who just were kind of like that. And I would encourage them to study and I would encourage them to come to the lessons, to the services during the week or to have, you know, make time to study with older brothers and sisters who were, you know, had plenty of time to study with them, but some people just didn't want to put the time in. And so um, they were very lean in their spiritual, <laughs> their spiritual self was very lean whereas people who were missioning all the time or going out to you know on the visitation circuit visiting with the elders visiting with the sick going to the nursing homes you know what i'm talking about those people that were always involved they were always so happy and full and and showed great gratitude and were thankful and and trying to make their life better and, and and for the most part making the lives of other people better as well so we can understand that easy read says lazy people always want things but never get them and those who work hard get plenty and that's we see that in many respects we see it in the spiritual realm and you can understand it in the in the uh, physical realm as well here's another interesting passage uh, Solomon says seeth thou a man diligent in his business he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. And this is certainly true. Uh, when you're diligent, I, you know, I've been, I've been fortunate enough to stand before some really um, important people in society, and meeting people like that every day. And I've learned from the Bible. God is my teacher. I mean, I'll go to, uh, if you will, the, you know, the Kingdom of Heaven University. 
because you can learn a lot about life if you apply God's principles and you can learn a lot about business Jesus said I'm you know he asked his, his mother and father when they were looking for him after he had been lost he said no you're not that I must be about my father's business and he's in the business of saving souls God has great businesses and if you look at Jesus ethics in his practice you can apply his life and his principles in your business and you will be very fortunate and you'll stand before a lot of important people and that's how I read it skilled workers will always serve kings they will serve important people and but people who are not diligent or have less important jobs they won't meet that many interesting people I, sh I would say even in the New Testament we have passages about diligence for example second corinthians chapter 8 and verse 22 paul said and speaking to the corinthians and we have set with them our brothers whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which i have in you and so paul was talking about the the diligence of the brethren and that's very important for brethren to be diligent in their work, be diligent in the Lord's business, be diligent in service. When there's an opportunity, jump on it. Don't wait to be asked. Be purposeful. You have a purpose-driven life. I remember that book many years ago. And so everyone in the church has a purpose. And when you understand it and find out, you know, and you can understand why God brought you into the kingdom and live up to... Uh, live up to those responsibilities, you will be a great tool in the hand of the Lord. He will be able to, to use us on many occasions, and that's what he's looking for. And Paul was so proud of the brethren that he spoke of, of, of these brothers and, and their diligence. And sisters, the brethren, that's what, that's what he's referring to. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, Peter chimes in. He says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. And so that has to do with our soul. Constantly working. Constantly being faithful and focused on our life and the life that we live in Christ Jesus. So remember, if you have to start over, while you're being diligent, you will face some things. We we'll have some challenges. We we'll face some difficulties. But remember, if you keep on trying, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There is an end of difficult or unpleasant situations that you and I are dealing with at the moment. And David spoke of God's mercy in Psalms chapter 30 and verse 5 when he wrote for his anger endureth but for a moment. So let me back up. So if you're feeling like, well, I can't get ahead because I did some things. I know God's not pleased with me and he's punishing me. He must be punishing me because I can't get forward. I can't move forward. Well, even in that, David said, his anger endureth but for a moment and his favor is life. And then he says, weepy may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. There's a, there's a light. There's a light at the end of this tunnel, so tough it out. Keep going. Think about the blessing that is on its way and what you need to do I've, I've said on many occasions is imagine the blessing imagine the blessings and the things that are getting ready to happen don't always think negative think about what's going to happen not in the, the situation that you're in now and that's what allows you to push through so keep striving why should I keep striving because it's it's only going to be for a short time and then you're you're going to strike gold if you keep going ask anyone who's uh, started a business or or a successful in anything they'll tell you that they face many challenges but they they had this you know this confidence and this being diligent and like I said it, it creates all of these wonderful things when you're diligent that you don't even know you possess so keep going until you strike gold you will finally get there the great thing about striving is you will eventually succeed now there, there's several examples of this in the Bible. One is Moses, for example. We're all familiar with Moses. Moses faced plagues, uh, Pharaoh's army, stubborn people. Moses had all sorts of struggles that would have made any leader give up. And far worse, 
were his internal battles that he had to deal with. And, and dealing with people in general, man, it just it sometimes will drive you crazy. And you'll ask yourself, why am I doing this? And Moses, as you read his story, he never thought about uh, leading the children of Israel out, out of the promised land, out of Egypt and the Exodus and God's people. He never thought about leading God's people into the promised land. This, there, there's no language that speaks of him knowing this in advance. And so he was just a shepherd. And worse, he was a shepherd with a speech problem. He had a speech impediment. So what made the difference? I'll tell you, what made the difference is, was his encounter with God that made all the difference in the world. And when you're introduced, when we're introduced to God or his word or to Christ and the church and the kingdom and God's plan, it makes all the difference in the world. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians who ye have seen today, ye shall see them again, no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Shh. <laughs> so notice what happened. The events of his life developed character, purpose, and strength. It took those challenges. It took those challenges that he had to endure. And as we see him developing, we see his character in the scriptures unfold with his character and his purpose and his strength. Moses was a changed man. Struggles and striving changed him. The story of Ruth starts with tragedy and several misfortunes. And as a widow and an outsider in her community, Ruth could have easily abandoned her mother-in-law, Naomi, and continued her life elsewhere. Right? She could have just moved on. Her mother said to her, go go back to your people. I know a lot of people said, cool, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> I'm gone. But this was the, the key passage to the whole thing for me. Uh, of these incredible odds that she faced with uh, Ruth chapter 1 verse 16 and to put it in the easy read version I, I want to do it and share that version with you she said Ruth said don't force me to leave you don't force me to go back home to my own people let me go with you where you go I will go wherever you sleep I will sleep Where, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. When you see Ruth in the next life, ask her, was it worth it? Was it worth the struggle? Was it worth starting on? For she didn't have anything. She lost everything. Everything. And she could have easily gone back home, gone back to the Moabites. But she said, no. She decided to start over. And as a result of that, think about this for a minute. She became the great, 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 great grandmother of King David. And having been the great, 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 great grandmother of King David, she also became a grandmother of the Messiah, of Christ. So if you ask her in the next life, Ruth, was it worth it? I'm sure she will tell you it was well worth the struggle. It's worth it. It's worth striving. It's worth starting over. Uh, Jeremiah, many people have had those struggles. Jeremiah said, I'm not preaching anymore. I'm not going to speak in the name of the Lord. <laughs> and he had a change of heart. He's, you know, he dug in. He was known as the weeping prophet, became one of the greatest prophets of Israel. And lastly, this list would be incomplete without including Jesus. No suffering comes close to the experience Jesus had from the Mount of Olives to his crucifixion on Calvary and even his life and the struggles that he had. Jesus has chosen to 
come here and the path that he chose was not easy. He even showed the apostles on the Mount of Transfiguration what his glory was like in heaven. But he left it all to come down and serve us and show us the way home. And I'm sure that if you ask him, he will explain to you and I it was because he saved mankind. He saved you and I. I remember on the cross or prior to the cross, he said, Father, you know, if this cup can pass for me, please let it pass. And then he added, yet not my will, but thine be done, Luke 22. So sometimes again, starting over is not easy. There are going to be times when we're faced with hardships and difficulties and we're not going to want to start over it's not easy and as I said difficult days will lie ahead and again the fine line between insanity and genius but those of us who choose to forge on and to keep moving forward uh, maybe we are straddling that that line but I choose to move forward and I, I I've chosen to Suffer Paul like Paul in the name of the Lord. And I I know for a fact, not only in the physical sense, but also in the spiritual sense, I will succeed. I will see glory. I will see the Lord's face in peace. And I'll make it back home. And I wish the same uh, upon all of you. Again, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Take care, and we'll talk to you the next time. Thank you, Brother Stevie B., for this opportunity. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. If you travel this road, you have a trial. Sometimes you're up, Lord. Sometimes you die. Help you travel the road you have. A trial you have trouble on every hand. Lord, temptations and hidden snares. They often take us unaware And we'll wonder why the day When we're trying just to do our best But if you travel this road you'll have A trial Sometimes you're up, Lord Sometimes you die Help you travel the road you have a trial you have trouble on every hand well I walk down to the railroad yes I stepped up to the track well I saw that big light coming you ought to see me About your face uh, I can taste just as much as I please If you want to beat me basin You have to fall on the wind and Lord, if you travel this road you have A trial Sometimes you're up, Lord Sometimes you die Help you travel the road you have A trial you have trouble on every You're listening, you're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Shout it out, question.
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a question from my social media platform called Shout It Out that we want to pose to my co-host Clay Phillips. Clay serves as the evangelist for the Rose City Church of Christ there in Thomasville, Georgia. And we want to also encourage our listeners to go to that uh, group there on Facebook and get involved in those biblical discussions. Brother Clay, how you doing this evening? Marvelous, my friend. Simply marvelous. How you now, doing? Yeah. I'm doing just fine. We have a doozy of a question. Now, this question, I believe, is asked in light of what we see that's going on in the world with the war between Israel and uh, Hamas. I think this question is very important to Christians today. And here's the question. It's from an anonymous query. And the question is, how important is Israel to Christians? What say you to this question? Thank you, Brother Steve. I believe that the question is a very advantageous question that needs to be answered in a biblical sense. Uh, Too often we get off track biblically and from the uh, dispensations that God lead us through. The Bible says in in Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners Speaking time past unto the fathers by the prophet, has in the last days spoken unto us by his son. God used very different things. Now I want to first of all let me uh, let the record be shown. I'm gonna give you three homiletics. Roman number one. Let me give you these first, because there's no way we'll be able to deal with all of this. But I'm going to give you the homiletics first. Uh, the Roman number one. We need to understand that God covenant with Abraham to really get a grip, to really understand what is going on with this today uh, is God covenant. We need to understand God covenant with Abraham, which was Abel at the time. And then the Roman number two, we need to understand this. Our spiritual inheritance is through the Jewish people. Our spiritual inheritance is through the Jewish people. And then Roman number three, we need to understand the restoration of Israel and the awakening of a new man. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. The restoration of Israel and the awakening of a new purpose, a new man. And so we're going to look at that, if you will, on this particular question. And so the the question says, how important is Israel to Christianity? Um, First of all, let me give you two targets. Number one, the first target we need to look at is that if God cares about suffering, if God cares about something, as Christians, we also must learn to care about what God cares about. <laughs> oh, boy, look at here. This is going to be all right. Let me say that one more time. If God cares about something, as Christians, we should also care about what God cares about. Uh, they should Uh, We should care about Israel. The Apostle Paul uh, addresses this. So let's look at the Bible. Let's look at what the book says, the Bible. Let's go let the Bible speak, Brother Clay Phillips. Let's turn our Bibles now with me to the book of Romans, chapter 10. Romans, chapter 10. I want to commence reading at verse number 1 through verse 4 for advocate of uh, explaining the message, and then we'll look at, I'll go down and drop down and look at some other scriptures. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1, the apostle Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might, <laughs> look, come here, that they might be Saved. So the Apostle Paul addresses this particular question 
How important is Israel to Christianity? And so here we look at the Apostle Paul said, listen, Paul, because understand now, the Apostle Paul was a Jew. He was an Israelite. He was a Jew among Jews. He was, he said, listen, I want y'all to understand something. If anybody care about Israel, I do. <laughs> if anybody care about Israel, I do. He says, he says, brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. Then in verse number two, he says, he said, now notice what it says, for I bear them record, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now understand this. When he says, I bear them record, he's using his own life for example. The word record there, uh, etymology simply means witness. He said, I am a witness of how you guys feel, how Israel feels, because I was messed up myself. I thought that uh, everybody should bow down to us. I thought. He said, he said now nobody said, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they've been ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So Pastor Paul said, listen, that's how I was. I was like that. I was going around, look at these book of Acts. I was going around killing Christians or putting them in jail. I held the jacket of the one that stoned Stephens. Something happened to me. <laughs> how important, Brother Phillips, is uh, Israel to Christianity. So notice now in verse number four, he says, for Christ, he says, he said, for Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believe it. So he, he explained to us, he said, listen, I understand. I really want Israel to be saved because I am a Jew myself. But he said, Bible, want y'all to understand something then. They have rejected Christ. They have rejected Christ. I rejected Christ because it was the Jews that crucified him. We crucified him. We, I, I was determined but until a bright light overshadowed. Now, I'm going to bring a bright light up in this thing tonight. Can, can I bring a bright light up in here tonight? Notice what it says in verse 11. Drop down to verse 11 and say some time. He says, for the scripture says, Whosoever, now, now pause and listen. I'm going to tell y'all now. I'm going to tell y'all what's the deal here. Whosoever, for the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. In other words, the, understand this, that the gospel is not uh, tied down to Israel. Let's, let's see what it says then. All right. well, I'm reading about it. This is in the book, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. <laughs> Paul said, now, I'm, I'm witnessing this. I understand this now. Because God has sent me, the Jew, to the Greeks and the Gentiles. God has sent me. God stopped me from understanding and thinking that I'm more important than other people. So now I got to share with you. I got to help you understand what is important. He says, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is important here? What is going on here? Notice that Paul said in verse 14. He says, now, how then shall they call upon him who did not believe? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Preacher, you got to help us out tonight. You got to share with us. You need to help us out tonight. Verse 15 says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written. Notice now, as it is written. 
How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Hello? So how important is Israel to the Christians? The, 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 the question should be asked is how important is Christ to Israel? And the Greek. <laughs> Let me buy the speak, Brother Clay. The question should be how important is Christ to all nations? The question, listen, I'm going to say it one more time. Because fair you, listen, fair you cannot be a word of omnipotence because God cannot fail. Hello? God cannot fail. Um, let, let me take you back to chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, let me show you how I tell you. In Romans chapter 2, and let's begin reading at verse number 10. Romans chapter 2 and the verses number 10. It says, but glory, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. Notice, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. <laughs> Let the Bible speak, Brother Clay. Now, 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 we want to know what, who, uh, how important is Israel to Christianity. We need to understand how important Christianity is to Israel and how important Christ is to all of us and to the Jews and the Gentiles. Notice what it says now. I'm going to read that verse 10 one more time. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. Now, notice in verse 11, for there is no respect of person with God. <laughs> Let the Bible speak, Brother Clay Phillips. For there is no respect of person with God. So the question itself is antithetical. So when you look at the word, the question says, how important is Israel to Christianity? or how important Christianity to Israel, the question is antithetical. Why? Because it is not that important with God. Because God has no respect in person. Notice that drop down to verse number 12 of Romans chapter 2. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. So using an illustration of the Gentiles, and then he's going to use the illustration of the Jew. Now watch this. Watch this. Listen. And as many as have sinned, notice now, in the law shall be judged by the law. So he's using two things here. He's using the Gentile and uh, the Jews or Israel. Verse 15, uh, verse 13 says, For not the hearers of the law are justified or just before God. In other words, God said, listen, just because you didn't hear the word doesn't mean that you are justified. But the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentile, which had no law, did by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are law unto themselves. Notice in verse 13, which show it the works of of the law written well, now notice that hello this is getting out Trey Lee Philip you get down to the nitty gritty notice what it says here he says he says in verse 15 verse 15 when uh, which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also being witness and their thoughts the meanwhile, meanwhile, it says excusing or excusing one another. In other words, we're trying to find who is important. <laughs> they trying to find out who is important. So now, so now what Paul does, Paul gives us the framework of uh, what is important. He said, listen, he, he explained to us the heart of a man is what's important. God looks at the heart and the conscience of a person, not his nationality, not whether he's black, green, blue, yellow, purple. 
God is not concerned because the whole ordeal was not about nationality. I, I'm going to show it to you. Tell somebody, hey, listen to this. Notice now, so what, so what he's saying here, he says in verse 16 of Romans chapter 2, in the day when God shall judge the secret of men by Jesus Christ according to the gospel. What is the most important? The gospel. What we must hear? The gospel. What we must preach? The gospel. What is important to the Gentile? The gospel. What is important to the Jews? The gospel. What is important to everybody? The gospel. <laughs> Let the Bible speak, Brother Slaney Phillips. Okay, now what do you mean by that? Now, what it's saying in verse 13, let me give you an exegetical setting of verse 13, but that the Gentiles will not be judged on the basis of the Jewish law. That the Gentiles will not be judged on the basis of the Jewish law. Then it's telling us, because that's what it says in verse 15, to mean while excusing or else excusing. So here, so the Jews will not be excused by the Gentile lack of law. So whether the Gentiles uh, do not, they do by nature the things contained in the law. And the Jews uh, was taught what to do through the law. So the Gentile will not be judged on the base of the Jews' law or the Jewish law. The Jews will not have any excuse because the Gentile, you know what, you can't say this, well, they didn't, they didn't do this and they didn't have this. And, and they didn't. You, you can't make that excuse because God gave you the law. He chose you purposely. And so you have no excuse for that. No, understand now, you have no excuse because God has no respect to person. Because it is our conscience. It is, listen, listen, it is the conscience. It, turn, the, turn your Bibles now to uh, 1 John. Everybody turn the Bibles now with me to 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. The Bible says, For if our heart <laughs> condemn us, God is greater than our heart. And knowing all things, God knows all things. What God, you, what God, what is important is our heart, the mind that thinketh. Now, there, there are uh, uh, exegetical, there's all, all things about the heart, but what I'm focusing on now is the mind that thinks. God wants you to think. Hello? He says in verse 21, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. So now what is important to me? Important to me is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn your Bible now to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. I got to hear up because I don't have much time. Galatians, uh, the chapter is 3. Everybody turn your Bible now to Galatians chapter 3, and I'm going to commence reading at verse uh, 26. Galatians chapter 3. And the verse is number 26. Notice what the Bible says here. Notice what the Bible says. For ye are all, hello, the children of God. <laughs> For we are all the children of God. So the question itself is antithetical. How important is Israel to Christianity? Or you can ask how important Christianity to uh, Israel is. But the, the issue is how important Christ is in our hearts. Our heart is what God is going to judge. Notice what it says now. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized woo, in the Christ have put on Christ. You, you, the issue is have you put on Christ? The apostle said, my heart desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul knew they were not saved because they were Israelites. He knew. Then he says in verse number 28, verse 28, come here, come here. Call somebody and tell them this. Listen, listen. There is neither Jew nor Greek. <laughs> Somebody in the body of Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. 
There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So the question is, what is important? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The thing is, we need to really understand what the gospel is. And First Corinthians teaches that, that the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What makes the difference is Christ dying on the cross. It has always been predicated in the mind of God. Because the Old Testament was written for our learning that we through patient and covenant of the scripture might have some hope. So when so what is written in the Old Testament about Abraham or Abram and the covenant of God made with Abram, that covenant of Israel is what never was going to stand until Christ it was going to stand to Christ came. So when Christ came, he became the end of the law. Woo! Look at it. Verse twenty nine. Verse 29, and if ye be crisis, let the Bible speak clearly, then are ye Abraham's, come here, come here, then are you Abraham's seed. How come according to the promise? Uh, unless, until you hear, believe, repent, confess, and baptize of the gospel. Then you become, uh, then you become the spiritual Israel of God. God's concern is about his people ex- accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. So, in Roman number one, you remember I gave you Roman number one, God's covenant with Abraham uh, was it written for our learning. That we through patience and covenant of the scripture have hope. So when God in Genesis chapter 12, read it for yourself, verse 1 through 3, when God gave Abraham, oh, okay, now I better read that because that's, that's, that's some good stuff. I better read that because I don't want to uh, leave you out on that hanging. Turn to uh, Genesis chapter 3. Let me show it to you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 26. Genesis 3 and the verses number, uh, let's do Genesis 3 and the verse is number. Uh, no, let's go to Genesis 12. Save some time because I don't have time to read all that. Genesis 12, verse 1. Genesis 12 and verse number 1. So if I try to go through all that. Now, let's read all that on your own. But Genesis 12 and the verse is number 1. And the Bible says, And the Lord said, And the Lord had said unto Abram, His name was Abram at the time. Remember now, His name was Abram at the time. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. And from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. Because I will make you a great nation. But now, what we must understand is that if God was speaking of providential scheduling. And so he said, I'll make you a great nation. And I will bless thee. And make thy name great. Even though physically God did this. But the purpose of it was that it was for the benefit that we learn from Abram about faith, because he's the father of faith. That's why Hebrews chapter 11 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Then it goes and says, and thou shalt be a blessing. Hello? Why, but why are they a blessing? For I will bless them that bless thee, I will curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So now understand, he's speaking of the covenant, the word of God. Understand this, the word of God is not bound and to one group of people. He used Abram, he used Abram to demonstrate his power, his love. And, and he's using the providential scheduling of this. So that's why there is no Jew nor Gentile now. That's what the Bible says uh, in Romans 1, 16. The Apostle Paul said, Paul said this now, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because at one time he was, because he was Saul, and God changed his name to Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is, <laughs> let the Bible speak, Brother Clay, it is the power of God unto salvation. That's what's important. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, watch this. 
to the Jew first <laughs> and then to the Greek. <laughs> so that's why Jesus, when he was on this earth, he was born under the law to redeem us from the law. And so that's why we must understand that. So here we must understand uh, to one group of people, uh, it, it, is, it is not to one group of people. Let, let, let me show it to you. Turn it. Uh, let me see. I got about uh, 15 minutes. Oh, man, that's a good time. Turn to uh, second. Everybody turn to the Bible now. Second Timothy chapter 2. Let me show you something. Second Timothy chapter 2. And the verse, I'm going to start reading, if you will, at verse number 8. Second Timothy chapter 2. And the verse is number 8. Man, this is, uh, uh, this is what uh, we need to understand in this time. Because Israel fighting against one another, but it, the problem, the reason why they fighting, because they fighting for that which is tangible, not which was spiritual. Because spiritual is, let, let me show it to you, Second Timothy chapter two, and verse number eight. The Bible says, "Remember that Jesus Christ, remember that Jesus Christ, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David." <laughs> was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Paul said, listen, Timothy, uh, Jesus Christ is the seed that it was talking about all this time. It was talking about Christ, wherein I suffered trouble as an evildoer. They call me evildoer, even unto the bonds. They put me in prison for this. But the word of God is not bound. <laughs> Speak, honey. The word of God is not bound to yes, Israel. It, it, uh, I'm a Gentile. The white man is a Gentile. The Jews are the Jews. Israelite. But we are, the word of God is not bound to a group of people. The Apostle Paul said it here. Then he goes and says, Therefore I endure all things. Now, another word says, Therefore, I endure all things for the elect sake. For the elect sake. Now, who are the elect sake? Those of us that believe that Jesus died, buried, rose again. Those that believe in the gospel. It is the gospel that we need to understand. It then says that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That's Bible. That's book, chapter, and verse. Read it for again. It is a faithful saying. Now, I can say this and be legit about it. It is a faithful saying. For if any, for if we be dead with him, <laughs> we shall also live with him. Now, what is important? You better Hear, believe, and put verse, and be baptized. Like as Christ died, buried, rose again the third day. That's what baptism does for us today. Hello? Then he goes and says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Hello? What is important? Christ, if we believe not, Yet he abided faithful. In other words, if you abide faithful, he cannot deny himself. Jesus, I'll, 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 I'll be there for you. I'll be there with you if you do what I ask. Now, let me, let me say this here. Let me say this here. Our spiritual inheritance is based uh, through the Jewish people. I understand that. I understand that the Old Testament, the Bible talks about that. I understand that. I understand what it's talking about. But let me help you, let you, let you understand how the new branch and the old branch are into the drafting of the tree. We need to understand that. We need to understand. I, I tell your Bible now to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And I'm going uh, to commence reading, if you will. I'm going to start reading at verse number 12. I'm going to try to wrap it up right here. Because I know I'm not going to have time to finish it all up. Romans chapter 12. Now, we're going to look at the perfect will of God. This is what this is talking about. 
to see the overall perfect will of God coming to influential, coming together, okay? The perfect will of God. So we got we got Romans chapter uh, 11. You're about to turn the Bible now to Romans chapter 11. And I'm going to commence reading at verse number 11. Now watch this. Listen to this here. I'm going to try to finish this up as much as possible. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Now you're talking about the Israelites, the Jewish people. Have they some that they cannot get right? <laughs> the Bible says, God forbid. Are they, are, they, are they important to us? Yes. God still, Jesus Christ still came down through their seed. They are important to us. They were important to God. God used Abraham and through the seed. Read Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Christ. It is imperative that we understand that they were important for the coming of Christ. Hello? And so it says, so the Apostle Paul said, listen now, I want you to understand. I said then, have they stumbled that they should not fall? God forbid. In other words, if, have they stumbled that they can't get right? But rather, through their fall, salvation. Now come here, come here. Salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. In other words, Israel, the reason why Israel is fighting, the reason why they're struggling, because they feel that nobody listening to them because they, salvation supposed to, came down through them, their genealogy, and it did. But the problem is that uh, they rather, through their fall, it helped the Gentiles. <laughs> so, so their failure allowed God to open the door for us. That's why they are so important. Now, can, can I go a little further? Can, can, can I read a little further? It says that and God provoked them to jealousy. That's why they, they want to fight. That's why they're fighting, because they're jealous, because they, we're talking about Christianity. We're talking about Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul was the same way, and they got jealous. And Paul said, I went everywhere <laughs> trying to kill. And that's what happened today. That's why they're fighting. Notice in verse number 12. Not if, they, not if the fall of them to be rich of the world and the Diminishing of them, the rich of the Gentile, how much more their fullness. In other words, he said, listen, we ought to take advantage of the opportunity of Jesus dying on the cross. Quit, you know, quit falling. Because what's going to happen is we all, uh, you're either going to end up being rich or you're going to be poor. You, you, you are when you're fighting and you're struggling. He said, why, why are you doing this? Because the fullness of Christ has already come. Jesus in the fullness of time. The Bible says, came in this world in the fullness of time. Then it goes and says, notice now, for I speak unto the Gentile in as much as I am an apostle of the Gentile, I manifest mine office. I'm telling you. This is what I'm telling you. I'm going to manifest my office and my ministry. My ministry is to the Gentile. So here, the Apostle Paul said, my ministry, God told me to go to the Gentile. Why? Because all men got a right to be saved. Verse number 14 said, but if, if by any means I have provoked to uh, emulation them which are my flesh, come out the Jews, that they might save some of them. I, I, I Paul said, I want to save some of them. That's why he said in verse number one of Romans 10, that I want to save some of them. Good God Almighty. <laughs> in verse number 15 says, for if the, notice now, if the casting away of them be the reconciliation of the world, that shall the receiving of them be but life, from the dead. In other words, he said, listen, God said, listen, I, the whole purpose was that all men are reconciled and come to him. 
Now let me let me drop down to save some time. Verse number twenty four, and I got uh, five minutes according to this, yeah, verse twenty four. For if thou would cut off of the olive tree, which is and notice why, which is wild by nature, and uh, cert grafted. So understand, <laughs> you got to understand the, the, the drafted. Understand this, that we are drafted. So he says that how are the branches, how are the new branches are drafted in? Does this mean that God has rejected the Jewish people? No. Forever? No. Of course not. What it means is neither have anything, neither of us have anything, come here, come here, neither of us have anything to boast about. For all have sinned, Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Jews don't have nothing to boast about. The Gentiles don't have nothing to boast about. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, understand this. If the wild, by nature, are contrary to nature, how much more, if, if, if God would engraft uh, the Gentiles, <laughs> the wild people, <laughs> if he address them, the wild folks, don't you know he's going to let the people that the, the Jews back in? He's he not going to let. He, he said, How much more shall these, the good by nature, be drafted into their own honor tree? So we listen. We can't walk around and fuss about uh, the, the Israel. There ain't no good right now. No, 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 no. The promise was made to them that we might have a right. And God allowed them to fall away, that he can make them jealous, that we can be a part of the kingdom, invite us in. That's what he did. And, and I don't have time to deal with all that. But my, I, uh, One thing I want to say, let me wrap this up. The restoration of Israel is the united of mankind. Hello? The, 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 the Listen, how important is Israel to Christianity is that Christians and Jews must come together and restore the restoration of mankind because man got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and I'm trying to read all that, uh, and became enmity. And, the, and, and we must understand the awakening of a new man. That's why the Bible says in Matthew chapter uh, 28, verse 16, the Bible teaches us, uh, he, he told the disciples, go into all the world. All the world, not some of it, all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature, all nations. He that believe it and is baptized shall be saved. I'm your speaker, but the clay Phillips, remember this. Keep it real. All of us are important to God. Not just the Jews, not but the thing is, it is Christ. It is Christ. I can't say it enough. It is Christ. That makes the difference in our lives. May God bless you. Shout it out question. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Oh, I need a friend. Someone that I can depend on. I don't want to live my life alone. Oh, I need the Lord. Oh, I need the Lord. I need the Lord as Savior. Oh, 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 I need a friend. Bum, 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 someone that I can depend on. I don't want to live my life alone. Oh, I need Jesus. Oh, I need the Lord. Oh, I need the Lord. Oh, I need the Lord. I need the Lord as Savior. Oh, I need the Lord and Savior. I do in my life. Because I know without Him there will be much pain and strife. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. Everybody needs the Lord no matter who you are or where you're from. There's no doubt I need Him in my life. Oh, I need 
healer. Oh, I need the Lord. Oh, I need the Lord. Oh, I need the Lord. I need the Lord and Savior. Oh, I need the Lord and Savior right here in my life. Because I know without Him there will be much pain and strife. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. Everybody needs the Lord no matter who you are, where you're from. There's no doubt I need Him. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. This is a program reminder. Stevie B's Media Production presents. We're airing live shows here on Blog Talk Radio. Telephone number to the live show is 713-955-0508. Or the website is www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Gospel Light Radio Show. On Tuesday evening, I'm hosting live shows. On the second, the third, and the fourth Tuesday of the month, I host the live show, What a Word in the Lord radio show. And on the second Tuesday of the month, this show will air from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I have a guest speaker from the Brotherhood of the Churches of Christ who will be making that proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also during that show, we have a community corner segment, and that segment is designed for small business owners and entrepreneurs. We have products and services for our communities. Also have two co-hosts on that show, Lou Gilbert. He serves as the evangelist for the Oval Park Church of Christ there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And also Isa Mullins. He serves with the Church of Christ there in Cary, North Carolina. And the third Tuesday of the month, that show will air at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And my co-host, Dr. Therica Lane, she's a board-certified obstetricianist and gynecologist. And she serves with the Gray Road Church of Christ in Cincinnati, Ohio. And she'll be hosting her show, Conversations with Dr. Lane. And on the fourth Tuesday of the month, that show will air at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And my co-host, Kelly Fletcher, she serves the Livingstone Church of Christ there in Indianapolis, Indiana. And she'll be hosting her show, The Kelly Fletcher Show. Then on Thursday evening each week from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I have, I'll be hosting a live show, the Gospel Light Radio Show. And there are eight co-hosts on this show. Clay Phillips, uh, Yusuf Ford, and Dr. Frank Washington, and Steve Cordo, Stanley Hubbard, Robert Lee Johnson, Jimmy Miller, and Brian Christian Coleman. And then gentlemen will be presenting lessons from the Word of God. And each week I have two of my co-hosts on the air with me. I'm also taking a question from my social media platform on Facebook called Shout It Out. I'll be posing to one of my co-hosts on that live show as well. Then on Friday night, I'll be hosting a live show, Stevie D. Acapella Gospel Music Blast. And this radio show is the 2022 recipient for the Macamba National Academy of Christian Acapella Music Artists Award for Outstanding Achievement in Record or Radio. This show will air from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 to 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. And on this radio show, I'm playing some of the world's greatest acapella gospel music artists, the sweet sounds of voices. And we're also interviewing artists, producers, 
writers, and with debut new music and also featuring old music on that show as well. And every third Friday of the month, we have a Top 20 Countdown show, and we also have on-demand episodes. There, there are just a variety of musical platforms that you can go to and listen to these shows. Where do you get your favorite podcast from? Just search for Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Apple, iTunes, YouTube, just to name a few. And just search for Stevie B's Media Productions. And uh, we also have recorded version shows. Uh, these are shows where album debuts mostly. And so the same playlist was used on the live show here on Blog Talk Radio. And the sound quality is excellent. It's done in beta high five, so you really enjoy what you're hearing on those recorded version shows. And these shows can only be heard on iHeartRadio on these shows, and also on Amazon Music. And just search for Stevie B recorded version shows. If you would like to become a sponsor for these radio shows, just contact my sponsorship manager, Michelle Marco. She lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Her telephone number is 954-687-4705. The three E's of Stevie B Media Production, it is the objective of this broadcast. We want to educate, we want to edify, we want to encourage you in the study of God's Word. And that will conclude our program announcements. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Stay tuned. My co-host, Steve Cotto, is up next. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Have you ever had a friend like Jesus who would wash away your sin? Make you hope up.
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And good evening, Stevie, and thank you for having me on the show once again, and welcome to our listening audience on the Blog Talk Radio platform, or whichever platform you happen to be listening on. Thank you for taking the time to be here to uh, study from the scriptures, and if you uh, have a Bible, if you want to open up to uh, Romans chapter 6, that is where we will be starting, or if you're technologically savvy and having a Bible app, open it up to Romans chapter 6, and we will be starting uh, there, and that's where we'll be spending most of our time. Now, several years ago, there was a film that came out called The Princess Bride. Um, I saw it years ago once, I think, and it's a pretty popular movie, kind of a spoof on the fairy tale genre. Uh, Peter Falk plays a grandfather coming to read a story to his sick grandson, and it's a story. The grandson doesn't really want him to read the story because the Princess Bride's got a lot of romance and that sort of thing, and what 11-year-old boy wants to Uh, listen about princesses and romance and that sort of thing. When I was his age, I was more interested in airplanes and things getting blown up and that kind of thing. That's just a guy, okay, just a guy thing. But it's a tradition in the family that this story gets read when uh, people are sick, so not to hurt Grandpa's feelings. Uh, He sits back and lets Grandpa read the story. It's Fred Savage from The Wonder Years uh, plays the grandson, and Peter Falk from the Columbo series plays the grandfather. And so the story centers on Princess Buttercup, who is a former farm girl who's been chosen to marry uh, Prince Humperdinck of the fictional kingdom of Florian. But she doesn't want him. She doesn't love him. She's lamenting the death of her one true love, Wesley, who was a hired hand on the farm where she came from. And whenever she would ask him to do something or give him instructions, he would always reply with, as you wish. And she eventually figured out that that was his way of saying that he loved her. So before her wedding, she goes out on a horseback ride and ends up getting kidnapped. And Prince Humperdinck, of course, is trying to track her down. He's supposed to be also trying to find her one true love, but she finds out that he's not. And her one true love eventually returns, but now he's a pirate. And I'm doing this as a a very quick thumbnail uh, version of the movie based on uh, Wikipedia, the Internet Movie Database, and my memory. So I may miss a few things here and there if you've seen the film and, and know it. So, But after being tortured by the prince, the hero of the story, Wesley, uh, they think he's dead, and they take him to Miracle Max to get him revived. And, but Miracle Max says, no, he's not dead. He's mostly dead. He's severely weakened. And so they get him revived, and after being mostly dead, he's able to come back and go and take on the bad guys. Now, here's where I'm going to tie this into the lesson. As a Christian, let me ask you a question. Are you dead to sin or only mostly dead to sin? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself that? Because according to Romans 6, we're supposed to be dead to sin. And it doesn't take too much looking around to see that uh, we've got a sin problem in the world. Sin is very prominent. Uh, It doesn't take uh, a lot of research or looking around a casual scanning of the local newspaper or news sites, if you're not looking at newspapers much anymore, to show us how rampant sin is. 
a daily demonstration of sin uh, is seen as we look at accounts of murder, stealings, dishonesty, drunkenness, and, and anything that you might think of. And, and a lot of those things, by the way, if you notice, society isn't necessarily looking on them as sins anymore. Now, Romans chapter 5 tells us in verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. So that is the origin of sin. That's where it comes from. That is the original sin. And by original, I mean that is the first sin. The doctrine of original sin as taught by the Catholic Church and some other denominations is not a biblical-based doctrine. When children are born, they don't inherit the sin of uh, their parents. They might inherit consequences, but that's not the same as being held accountable for the sin of their uh, parents. And in Romans chapter 3, we see the nature of sin beginning in verse 9. Paul says that sin is present in both Jews and Gentiles. Now, you got to remember that in chapter 1 of Romans, Paul talks to Gentiles. Chapter 2, he's talking to Jews. And beginning in chapter 3, he's talking to everybody. And when you read Romans, it's a good idea to pretend the chapter breaks are not there, because some of the chapter breaks are not in the best places. And as we're going to see here with chapter 6, that's not a really a good chapter break there. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We see the consequences of sin. Wages. We earn a wage. And with sin, we die and are separate from God. The conclusion of our two spheres of life is that sin pays death, but God renders on the one who follows him eternal life in Jesus Christ. There's the two spheres, the physical, the spiritual. And the possibility of salvation has been made known ever since Acts chapter 2 and uh, Pentecost. God has never hidden the fact that he wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, in Romans chapter 6, we can see the reality of the salvation God offers. Look at chapter 6. Now, the context for this actually begins back up in chapter 5, uh, at about verse 12. Uh, so when, as you read it, if you're going to read this in its full context, start uh, with chapter 5, go back about verse 12, and read on, actually verse 9, and read on, and pretend that chapter break isn't there because he's anticipating an objection or a question that the Romans might have, and he's answering it here uh, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now, Paul speaks of the importance here, of course, of immersion or baptism in the plan of salvation and the link that Jesus plays between man and God. But sometimes even God's people need to be reminded of the salvation that we have and what we enjoy. And this is also good for this lesson uh, is also good for people who who aren't Christians, because we're going to look at the biblical doctrine or, or not doctrine, but the, the plan of salvation. Yeah, doctrine would be a good word to use there and how how we how how it is affected see the issue here in Romans 6 is one that makes the case that there is no basis for a christian to live a life of sin because many who had obeyed the gospel at that time uh, that paul is writing had acquired the notion that by sinning we would gain god's grace and the more grace god gave the better it made him look so in other words i uh, i sin do whatever sin and I come to God and I pray and I ask for repentance. God uh, forgives me, grants me grace and mercy. And so that makes God look good. So if I go and sin again and then come back and repent and God gives me grace, the more I sin, the more grace God gives. Therefore, the better God looks. That was the idea that was going through the Romans' head. And Paul here beginning 
in verse one of chapter six is saying, no, wait a minute, uh, you, you got it all wrong. That that that's that's not the case at all. He wants to dispel that myth. God's grace is no basis, no excuse, no reason for sinful living. And that old line, I think it was from Flip Wilson way back in the 70s, oh, the devil made me do it. No, that doesn't hold water. That That is not uh, going to work. James chapter 4, verse 7 tells us to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So if you resist Satan, he will not be able to tempt you to sin. Because sin, in the end, is a choice we make. Now, you can't control where temptation comes from. It could be, hit you any time, anywhere. But it is up to you to uh, hold uh, fast to your faith, hold fast to what you know is right, and not give in to the temptation. So uh, let's uh, – oh, in James one twenty seven, keep yourself uh, – uh, the true and undefiled religion is to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. First John chapter 5, verse 4, John says that the one who is born of God overcomes the world and has the victory. And so here in Romans 6, Paul gives reasons why we should not live in sin. We can have the victory. We can overcome it. So think about as you're going through, are you dead to sin or just mostly dead to sin? Because Christians need to be dead to sin. Sin should have no effect on us. Paul, and look at verse 2. Paul is stating a possible question. This is the question he's anticipating uh, when he says, uh, actually it's verse 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, certainly not. Now, I think the old King James says, uh, God forbid. But the idea is, no, we should not be continuing in sin so that uh, grace uh, can abound. See, the, the idea here is that God's grace should not lead us to unrestricted uh, sinful acts. Uh, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue? No. God's grace is not licensed to continue in sin. Paul is rejecting the idea that God's grace should lead us to that conclusion. He is affirming the freedom from the necessity of keeping the old law in order to be acceptable to God, but he never relaxes the ethical demands that are placed on us. Look at verse 6 of Romans 6. Baptism symbolizes our death to our old way of life and the beginning of our new life in Christ. And in baptism, that old nature is put to death. You are born again at that point. You are starting over before God. And he who has died to sin, look at verse 7. He who has died to sin is freed from sin. Now, many times over the years, I've noticed that when we talk to somebody about salvation, we present the gospel plan, we treat baptism many times as the end. You know, hear the gospel, believe it, repent of your sins, confess Christ, be baptized, five steps of salvation, boom, we're done. But if you think about it, baptism is more like a commencement. Now, what's commencement? That ceremony, remember when we graduated high school or college, we went through a ceremony that was called commencement. Okay, now wait a minute. I just finished 13 years of education, 13 because I count kindergarten, uh, and I'm finished, or I just finished my degree, my bachelor's or my master's or whatever. And, and wh Why are we calling this ceremony commencement? I I'm finishing. Well, if you think about it, we are beginning a new phase of your life. You graduate high school, so where are you going to go? Okay, I'm starting a new phase of life. I'm going to college. I'm going to trade school. I'm going into the military. I'm going to work in the family business. I'm going to maybe uh, continue whatever job I had in high school for a year or so and kind of figure out what I want to do. It's a commencement. It's a beginning of a new phase of life. Baptism is a commencement. It is beginning a new nature, a new phase of life as we uh, come up out of the water and we are now going to serve God. And that is where we need to remember to really give the encouragement to new Christians Make sure that before they leave, they've got a, a stack of phone numbers, emails, uh, social media contacts. We've got to stay in touch with them. That's why we lose so many converts is because they go, remember, the, the new Christian is going to leave that church building. He's going to go home to his family, and he's, hey, I became a Christian today. Oh, yeah, that 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 that's cool. Uh, what time does the game start? Hey, did you pick up the pizza because we got people coming? The family's not going to get it. 
So we've got to make sure they have a family of friends, a new uh, circles, and, and then we go out and try and, and uh, win their family and their friends uh, to Christ as well. Romans chapter 6, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 3. Then we go into verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now notice that is when we die to sin, is when we are baptized. So here's the question. Romans 6, the first six verses, says we die to sin at our baptism. Not before, not after. So, question. If one is not dead to sin, is one a Christian? So if I'm not dead to sin, if I haven't died to sin, am I a Christian? Well, the answer is no. And if one is not baptized or immersed as taught in Scripture, is one a Christian? Once again, the answer is no. We have to be dead. This is just like a body. You're at a funeral. Uh, I'm sure most of us have gone to a funeral or two, and the deceased is there in the in the casket. There's grandma or mom or dad or whoever. Nothing we can do is going to wake them up. I was at a funeral once, and a little girl, this is a true story, a little girl was, because uh, uh, I was there, uh, about three or four was uh, we were going by the casket at the viewing before the service, and a little girl about three or four was standing up trying to see in, so her dad picked her up, and she looks in the casket, and it was a relative that had passed away, and she looks at it, looks at dad, and asks dad, is she asleep? And dad, not really wanting to get into a deep theological discussion with a four-year-old, a three-year-old at that time, just said, well, yeah, I guess she could say that. Oh, well, wake her up. No, it doesn't really work that way, of course. In Ephesians chapter 2, the, Paul told the Christians there at one time were dead in their trespasses and sins. Okay, that means you're not alive to God at all. You've got to, to get away from that way of life. And Paul tells us that God's grace is not going to be given to people who walk according to the course of this world. That is, we should not be conformed to the ideas that are opposed to Christ. The Ephesians were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan. Now, it does not mean they were worshiping Satan and the, you know doing all, all the, uh, that sort of thing, but their ideas, their lifestyles, choices they made were not in accordance with God's will, and so they were living under, his, under Satan's influence. You're either going to be influenced by Satan or influenced by God. And the cause of the alienation from God is our own sin. When a person is separate from God, it is never God's fault. You've got to remember that. Someone once said, if you feel like you, you, you have a distance between you and God, who is it that moved? It's not going to be God. And here in Ephesians, Paul is emphasizing the lifestyle that Christians used to live. And in that state, they were estranged from God. And when we fall into sin, we are separate uh, from God. And because Christians are dead to sin, two things need to be considered. Romans 5 verse 1 says the guilt of sin is removed. Now, if you went to uh, VBS as a kid, you were probably taught that uh, uh, to be justified means God treats you just as if I'd never sinned. And that's a good way to look at it. Uh, because the sin is removed, we are justified, God's action is complete, and man is now acceptable uh, before God. Romans 6, you drop on down to verse 12. We see the desire that produced sin is to be controlled because in the cross, God has broken sin's power. He's made you free, so we should, you should live as a free man. God has accepted you as a, as a child of his, so act like it. Uh, you might have heard the story of a soldier brought before Alexander the Great and uh, who had been really misbehaving, insubordinate, just kind of a troublemaker. And Alexander said, what's your name, son? And uh, the, the young man said, well, it's Alexander. And glaring at him, the king said, either change your conduct or you change your name. And when God has accepted you as a child of his, that's the way we need to act. We need to be the light that leads people to the Lord. And if we're not going to do that, we need to change our conduct or change our name. Because we are to be dead to sin, even though sin is not dead. Sin is still going to come back and, and, and hit us. Uh, even even Jesus, you look at Luke's account of his temptation. When the temptation was over, it's uh, Luke recorded that Satan left Jesus for a time. 
or until a more opportune time. So he came back. He wasn't just going to let me. I think Satan knew the stakes. He knew what was up. And he wasn't about to uh, let this go away without making a fight. But uh, Jesus withstood the temptation. He was tempted in all ways as we are, but was without sin, Hebrews tells us. Because we we, we got to think in cartoons, sometimes you'll see a uh, a termite that gets loose and devours a house in seconds, makes it a pile of sawdust. Well, we know in real life termites don't work that way. In fact, you could stand out, and I've, I've done this when we've been looking for houses, stand out on the curb, you look at the house, it looks really nice, it's got a nice, great, uh, beautiful paint job, the yard is pristine, the porch looks really nice, and then you go in and start looking around, yeah, this looks pretty good. But then you go over, cut a little hole in the in the drywall, the sheetrock, and you look in, and oh, there's all the termite damage. And you can see the termite colonies are going around. From the outside, it looks great. But it's on the inside where the trouble starts, which goes along with what Jesus told us, that uh, sin, adulteries and fornications and that sort of thing, start where? Inside. They rot us out on the inside and then work their way out and eventually can become actions if we don't do something with them. That's how sin works. Uh, and, and it takes time. It takes time for those termites to destroy the house. It can take time for sin to work its uh, way in us. But we've got to keep our guard up. We've got to remember to uh, resist Satan, flee from, from him, and, and um, uh, bring ourselves closer to God, draw near to God. So t we need to be dead to sin as Christians. And then remember that we are in Christ. Let's go back to our text, Romans uh, 6. Look at verse 3 and 4. Do you not know as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore... We were buried with him through, de through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So in order to explain the Christian's relationship to Christ, Paul turns the discussion to baptism. He, he seems surprised. Paul seems surprised that the Romans are not aware of the fact they are in Christ. Christ is the source of our salvation. And baptism is the gateway into that salvation. And in verse 4, you see that we are to sever ourselves from our old way of life. The old self is the believer before we came to trust in Christ. And he's using this imagery. Paul is using the imagery of death for, I think, a couple of reasons. One, it's, it creates an obvious point of contact with the death of Christ. That's an important step here in Paul's, uh, the, in the argument he's trying to make. And, and it increases, uh, or rather, it's the obvious point of contact with uh, the severing our old way of life as well. And it's a powerful image of a decisive shift in our in our state or in our in our being. The death of the old man is that separation from the body that uh, was enslaved to sin. Verse seven: He who has died is free from sin. So there's the separation from our old way of life. Now, since Christians are in Christ, we have that special relationship with him. Galatians chapter 3 says that uh, the, the exp uh, tells us that we are baptized into Christ. As many of us have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And this is to become a member of. Uh, and, and that is one of the things that the context of Galatians 3 tells us, that we are now a member of Christ. We are a part of Christ because we have been baptized into Christ and that is uh, symbolizes our new spiritual existence. Now, being baptized into Christ, putting on Christ, that is a choice. Just like the clothes we wear every day. We get up, and if you wear a suit and tie to work, well, you go to the closet, pick out something, and put it on. Or if you wear blue jeans, you pick out a pair of jeans and a shirt, put it on. You made that choice. Now, if you put on that, that pair of jeans and that shirt, and you decide, oh, no, nah, it's going to be a a hot day today, I don't need this flannel shirt, I'm going to put on a t-shirt. You made a choice to change. And then you could just say, ah, I'm not going to wear these clothes at all, take them off, put on something else. You made a choice. Putting on Christ in baptism is the is a choice. God doesn't pick some and choose others. You make the choice to become a Christian, to be baptized into Christ, and then you make the choice whether or not you're going to stay uh, clothed in Christ. You can take it off. You can walk away if you want, and unfortunately, Christians 
uh, do that. The idea of eternal security or once saved, always saved is, is just not taught in Scripture. Uh, just like uh, sinner's prayer and things like that, those are not taught in Scripture. Uh, those are man-made ideas. But getting back to our text in Romans, baptism is how we participate in and we reenact the death of Jesus. That's how we are reunited and indwelt uh, by the Holy Spirit in a non-miraculous way. The Christian is justified also by the blood of Christ. We were enemies at one time. If you just back up to Romans 5 and look at verses 9 and 10, he says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, by Jesus' blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Notice that word enemies. That is a pretty strong word. Now, I know in my life maybe, I don't know, five, six maybe people, maybe fewer than that, that I would count as enemies. And most of that was when we were kids and just doing the foolish things we do as we're kids, as adults now. You know, I probably couldn't even tell you why it is that I counted them as enemies. It's been so long ago. But God, we were enemies of God. Why? Well, because of sin, sin separating us. So God took care of the problem. As enemies, we were hostile to God. We were hostile to Christ because of, because of sin, and God cannot have sin in his presence. Now, when I see some of these modern Christians, they call themselves Christians, who insist that the atonement of Jesus is an outdated doctrine, um... They do not understand what they're saying essentially is they do not understand the holiness of God. They do not understand just how serious sin is with God. And the, Jesus came in to pay the price for our sins so we could be reconciled to God. So if you're in any group that uh, tries to make light of that or downplay, you need to get out and find a place where they are teaching the truth. Jesus came to pay that price so you could be reconciled to God. And that's Paul's point. God took the initiative to bring about reconciliation between God and humans. And when you become a Christian, you are a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 17, tells us. You are a new creature in God's sight, and so we should rejoice in it. That is something to be, to be rejoiced, to be, to be joyful and happy. Your sins are forgiven. You've got that burden lifted off of you. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God uh, in Christ has reconciled us the, has reconciled the world to himself, not impugning their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So it doesn't matter how good or bad a person thinks he is. It doesn't matter what sins uh, someone has committed. God wants you to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth and wants you to be that new creation. And as a Christian, we have that new life. We're in Christ. We're dead to sin. We have that new life because of what Christ did for us and our response to that gift. We are free from the guilt of sin. We have been acquitted. We stand before God justified. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11, tells us we will not be free now of adversity. We, we, are, we are free from the burden of sin. We are now uh, in Christ, but look over at Ephesians chapter two, uh, chapter four for just a minute. And uh, Paul said, verse eleven, he says, "Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need." So we're not going to have a problem-free life. Well, the prosperity gospel says if you're a Christian and you're faithful, you'll be healthy and wealthy. That's simply not true. Look at the life of Jesus. Look at the end. They put him on a cross. They they beat him. Uh, they rejected him. Look at Paul, imprisoned and stoned. They didn't have easy lives, and I don't think you can make the case that either one was being displeasing uh, to God. 
So we will have adversity in life. Sometimes we simply just have to live with adverse circumstances. Uh, we can pray that they'll be taken away, but uh, sometimes we just have to go uh, through them. Paul had many adverse circumstances. Second Corinthians 11, he detailed his sufferings uh, to the brethren at Corinth. Beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, robbed, betrayed by his own countrymen. He had to constantly defend his apostleship against various detractors. And many of Paul's opponents were old colleagues from Judaism. But despite these troubles, Paul continued to work for Christ. The adversities he encountered were considered uh, occupational hazards, basically. And because of Christ, we have a life of hope. Paul ha had that hope. You can have that hope. Hope is faith in the future as God's promises of an eternal home. Paul does not ever envision a time that we will not stand on grace. There's a couple. There's a double negative there. But, it, but Paul is inver envisioning that we will always stand in grace when we stand before God. We do not want judgment. I know we, we had a lot of people running around, we want justice for this and justice for that, and we want justice. No, when it comes to God, you don't want justice. If you want justice, God will give it to you. But it's not going to be what you want. I had a friend years ago who once said, when I stand before God, I don't want justice, I want mercy. I'm throwing myself on the mercy of the court. I think that's a pretty good strategy. Because of Christ, we can have that hope. We can have that mercy and that grace and not have uh, God's justice and wrath come down on us. We can have, uh, as children of God, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, to those who receive Jesus, to them he gave the power to become sons of God. And he has given people purpose uh, since his earthly ministry. He came to give us life and give it more abundantly. Now, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, if you have received Christ, you have the power. I hear people say, well, I received Christ on such and such a date. Have you received Christ? Well, yes, I have. And congratulations. You now have the power to become a child of God. Huh? What do you mean? I thought receiving Christ made me a child of God. No. John says that if you receive Christ, you have the power. You have the right. You have the ability to become a son of God. You believe in Jesus, you do well. The demons believe and tremble. If you believe in God, you're at that level. You now have the power to become a child of God. You know, we just, uh, about half the states just had an election here a couple of days ago. And as a U.S. citizen, I've got the right to vote. Now, does that mean I vote? Well, no. And a lot of people who've never voted, never will, they have no interest in it. I know people that it doesn't matter what the issue is or the election, they want to be the first in line to cast their ballot. Okay, so if I have received Christ, I have the power. It doesn't mean I am a child of God. But this goes back to Romans 6, that I need to be immersed uh, or baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of my sins so that I die to sin. And then I am raised up to walk a new life. As Christians, we need to be dead to sin and, 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 and not practice sin. And as Christians, we, we are not perfect. We're just not controlled by sin uh, or its desires. We've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We are free from sin and from its guilt. So let me go back to the question I asked at the beginning. Are you Christian? Are you dead to sin? Or are you mostly dead? Or are you not dead at all to sin? If you have not been immersed into Christ, you're not a Christian. And you can call yourself one, but you're not a Christian unless you've been baptized into Christ and way raised to walk that new life, and you do it out of faithful obedience uh, to to the Lord, faithful obedience to have your sins forgiven. And if you're not a Christian, you're not sure, then contact one of us here on the show. We'll be glad to study with you or help you find somebody in your area so that you can be properly taught what you need to do to become a Christian. What is it you need to do to be saved? Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, uh, Stevie, on the show, and we will see you in the next broadcast. That's all I have for this evening. Thanks for having me. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show.
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our show. I want to thank you for spending a little time with us this evening in a study of God's Word. I want to thank my co-host Yusuf Ford and Steve Cotto. Both did an outstanding job in their proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can sit and listen to these gentlemen all day in a study of God's Word. Certainly appreciate my co-host Clay Phillips. He answered a very tough question there regarding how Christians should feel about Israel. He did a great job in explaining that question to us and answering that question from the word of God. I certainly appreciate his efforts. I appreciate all my co-hosts who are willing to come on this show each week and proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. What a blessing. I really appreciate them for that. It's my prayer that these lessons this evening have been beneficial to your spiritual lives and your relationship with the Lord has been strengthened because you not only tune in to this radio broadcast, but you've given yourself over to a study of God's word. So until we meet again, I pray God's continuing blessings upon your lives and that he bless you real, real good. You've been listening to the Gospel Light radio show. On behalf of my co-host, we really do appreciate your love and support 
for these programs. I'm your host, Stevie R. Butler. Good night, everybody. God bless you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Yeah. Uh-huh.
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show.